I remember playing against you uh, at El Jimador Cup, mm -hmm. and you guys whooped us, dude. Six to one, I think, or like four to one. <laughs> I wouldn't say whoop, but it was a good game. <laughs> yeah, and then um, no, it's it's crazy because like just you know playing in Pasadena everywhere, mm -hmm. I would always see you, and I was like, dude, who is that guy? One time I went to Sharif's like camp, and he was like, and everyone thought I was you. Because oh, really? I had my hair short. And then uh, they're like, oh, is that Jesus? So, like, someone kicked the ball. And yeah. I was like, luckily, obviously, I played soccer, so yeah. I kicked it back. And this was like, uh, Sharif was like, dude, like, that's that's Dario. That's not, that's, that's not Jesus. <laughs> we're story related. We look alike. Yeah, so I guess so. We look a little bit alike. No wonder and... we play alike. <laughs> Except I'm a right, right footed. I'm so. sorry. You, I take the left, you take the right. Yeah. So, dude, tell me more about yourself. I'm, I'm super excited to have you here. I'm pumped i i can't even like express myself through words right now but this is this is exciting you're on the podcast tell me more about your background what you're up to where do you see yourself where are you going well first of all i want to say thank you for having me appreciate you for being the first one guest i guess you can say yeah definitely. Uh, but yeah um i'm from pasadena california i mean i'm 20 years old I play soccer for a living. I still do, luckily. I mean, I mean, I guess where I can start with my background is, you know, I'm a only child. Okay. So my mom is a single parent. She kind of raised me my whole life. So that alone was just tough for me because my father was in and out of the picture, and then finally he was nowhere to be found. Like, kind of, kind of, kind of like cut ties. So it was just my mom and I, and she was working two jobs. I was still like in elementary school. Shit. So my mom was trying to, you know, do the best she can. And I guess a lot of people say when you're an only child, you're spoiled, but it was opposite for me. Like we had a, to be honest, we had a house probably like the size of this, this room. Oh shit. No room, nothing. It was you walk in, you have a couch, that was a living room. You look to your right, that's the table, that was our dining room. We had bunk beds in front of it, so that was our li our bedroom. And then we had a, a little kitchen, which is the size of this, and then a little bathroom. So it was just us living there for, I don't know, I think until my sophomore year of high school. Oh, in high school? Wow. Yeah, when my mom moved out with her husband. And at the time, I left home because... School wasn't my thing. So they moved me to another home where I was living in Chino Hills. And that family was, their son played club with me and he was, the father was a coach. So I grew up with them. They're like, we're going to take you in and you're going to do better in school and try to graduate. So they took me in, went to Chino Hills High for junior and senior year. But kind of not having so much of boundaries and someone to kind of tell me what's right and what's wrong or don't do this and do that. I fell off and kind of just had a, I don't even know how to say it, but they kind of gave me a choice between trying to finish high school yeah. or go to prom. Okay. And my choice was I'm going to go prom. So they kicked me out of the house. Oh, shit. So I went back home. So it's kind of like my, I mean, my child wasn't the best, but I, my mom made it the best that she was able to make it. Yeah. So that's kind of like a little bit of my background. Soccer picked up probably like when I was eight or nine. Played in Villa Park. Oh, Villa Park, Pasadena. So yeah, Villa course. Park is where everybody, I grew up. Yeah, everybody, everybody from Pasadena yeah. grew up from there. Sure. So. Everyone play, graduates from Villa Park. Yeah. And everyone has a story about Villa Park. Everywhere I go, it's like, oh, I play Villa Park. Or you play Villa Park. Mm -hmm. Or have you played? Like, and everyone for sure says... I played there at some point. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, it's crazy. Like, I feel like you're from Pasadena and you play soccer, you had to play Villa Park. You had to play. <laughs> or else we don't say you're from Pasadena. <laughs> that's the case. Like, yeah. You got to start from Villa Park. Yeah. Like, so that's where I grew up, literally like two blocks away from Villa Park. That's great. Played for Peñarol growing up. Which Peñarol. Is, which is, wasn't like anybody, but, you know, I didn't have to pay anything for practice or games or stuff like that. So walking distance. So I used to walk myself to practice. My mom would be at work, so we didn't have laundry. So I used to go early to the laundromat around the corner, bring my coins, wash my uniform, go walk to practice, like all crispy. And while I'm doing laundry, like 
I have enough to do to play video games. So I'm playing right there and then walk to practice, come back, and then my coach was nice enough to drive me back home, come home to empty home because my mom was still at work. Sure. Until like maybe midnight when I'd be asleep. Same thing again the next day. My mom wake me up early, let's go to school, and drop me off, she goes to work, picks me up or go to my best friend's house. Yeah. Stay there until my mom can pick me up and then it was just one of those things where it's just her and I and it's been a blessing because I kind of have I know what it is to have nothing to have something I won't say I have it all but I appreciate little things that didn't have before yeah so kind of that's my grew up kind of poor but hey I'm here we're living my mom's happy I'm blessed so it's all good dude that that reminds me a lot of not exactly my situation growing up but you know like we didn't have like the best clubs yeah. and the best teams and always played in like the Mexican leagues and they weren't like in Pasadena until I didn't move over here to this side of town into Eagle Rock until okay. I was 15. So that's when I really started kind of noting no, noting and knowing what Pasadena yeah. was. And I stopped playing soccer for a while until I was about 22 because of a I broke my leg. Oh, and then I was like, yeah. that injury really impacted me. But going back to just you know, growing up in teams and having to kind of do your own thing. I feel like it's it's part of that. I don't know if it's part of the culture. It's just <laughs> part of like, it's, I feel like it's always like just part of who we are. Like yeah. It's, it's soccer, practice, eat, repeat. Yeah. And, and that's that's crazy. I mean, soccer, if it wasn't for soccer, I wouldn't meet half of the people that I know right now. Same. And I wouldn't even know, like, we wouldn't even be having this podcast. Like, yeah. we wouldn't have nothing to talk about. If it wasn't for soccer not that we wouldn't be talking about i'm just saying not nothing to, but yeah it's a, but it's a starter like yeah. you know it's like it's one of those entrants like like a lot of people it's like oh i know someone like comes in oh so. sorry we had a little interruption i think there's like a baby in the back here yeah. two kids coming yeah. in but um that's first podcast so here we go we got to we got to take start it from for, somewhere you got to start from somewhere yeah. exactly so starting from somewhere it's like you start from somewhere and then you build up and and that's like one of the biggest things like i always want to ask you it's like how do you get the drive to even go through all of that and really end up in a position where you are now as a professional soccer player i always felt like I would always tell my brother, like I have an older brother. Yeah. I was like, and he would play, and I was like, dude, one of us has to make it pro. <laughs> like, yeah. one, like we just as long as one of them, one of us makes it, like yeah. we're, we're gonna be fine. Like our family will do better, and then we'll we'll elevate from there. And I I wonder like what how what kind of energy, what kind of drive, what motivates you every day? It's just like you gotta explain that to I me. I mean, if I'm being honest, it started. When I was a kid, yeah, my mom always told me like, do something with your life. You have everything. You just do it. Like put your mind to it and do it. So obviously, growing up, I couldn't been like, my mom's not home. Let me be in the streets. Which I there was times you know you kind of slip up and you start doing stuff like that. But yeah. then you get in trouble by your parents and you and like my mom's like, you can't do this blah blah. blah. So I was like, all right, let me let me do soccer. Yeah. So I did Villa Park. And at that time, I wasn't even, like, good. I was just, one of the things, like, you know, you just want to do it because you played elementary school with your friends. So it, what helped me was when I got to club, which I played for Sharif at the time, was FC Barcelona. Yeah. And I remember my Villa Park coach took me there with his son. And what happened was we went and trained. And the Sharif only wanted me. Oh, shit. So the the coach was like, "You come back, like you're not gonna stay here, blah blah blah." So I remember I found out that club you had to pay for for monthly fees, yep. <laughs> uniform fees, tournament traveling, all that stuff. Travel. Right away they told me I was like, I told him like I can't afford it. Like my mom's a single parent, I can't afford it, but I appreciate it. So there was a a manager that, of my age that was, well, he was managing like kids my age at with Sharif. And he kind of said, we want you here. Let me take care of you and pay all your fees. Yeah. So I said, okay, cool. Let me tell my mom about it. And he took care of everything. So my mom was like, look, you have a chance now to exceed 
at what you want to do and here's a you have this window expand where it's like you want to be great or just do it for fun don't waste people's time oh wow so my mom was always, told you that. yeah so she's like crazy. you know a lot of people don't come into your life and say i'm willing to help you out pay for this when it's you know money that's playing club is not cheap so my mom was like make the best out of it so she kept pushing me go early to to training because street will have like extra sessions like an hour before practice do shooting do crossing and then it's like my mom was like always on top of me so i was like you know what let me take advantage of this and what kind of just helped me get into the habit of trying to do more and get better was, you know, my mom. So I kind of saw the, the progress and of me getting better. I started playing club, I guess. I was the tallest guy on the team yeah, and I was able to kick the, the furthest. <laughs> so that was my job. Get the ball, just kick it up. Yeah. So I, for me, it wasn't like I'm not good, but I was good enough to play club. So as soon as I got better, it was like, you can make something out of it. My mom kept pushing me, keep going. Like, you don't belong in the streets. You know, you can make something out of it, but just keep going. And it's like one of those things where it's like every year I was doing something better. I became this player and eyes were on me and this and that. So it's like, it wasn't for my mom kind of just pushing me and saying, I support you 100%. Yeah. I don't think I would have been where I'm at now because someone like that that was behind me the whole time whether she didn't she couldn't go to my games because she obviously was working that happens all the time I, yeah. I used to see that all the time it was just no one would be there just yeah <laughs> it was just me yeah and I, obviously the parents would bring their kids and it's like i was used to it but at the same time i knew i was doing it for a reason like to do something with it and kind of just see how far i can take it obviously i'm already here i know i can grow and become something better but if it wasn't for, you know, my mom, I don't think. You would be in the position that yeah. you are now because of your 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 mom pretty much. Yeah. Wow. I mean, she wasn't around. So it's like a lot of parents like, I'm not around. You can just go play and whatever. And But my mom wasn't, wasn't around, but she was still pushing me, right. making sure like I'm doing the right things to get better if, if I wanted to play pro. Yeah. You know, once I had like 15, I kind of had an idea like, I can be a professional soccer player, but I'm just starting. And I was like, you can, but what are you going to do about it? And it's kind of like what drive me to become, I guess, a pro athlete at a young age, in a way. Wow. That's that's a very, like, pragmatic way of saying, <laughs> like, your story. I yeah. feel like, you know, there's a lot of mystery behind, like, I always thought, like, you know, that, well, you know, I'm a soccer player. Yeah. My dad was a soccer player. And the drive is because my parents gave me this, like, almost like this blueprint of yeah. how to be a soccer player. You know, I, you see a lot of those stories and yeah. people are, you know, are kind of given that. And I always wonder, like, what really drives someone that, well, that isn't given that master yeah. plan? How do you find that, like, will and that drive and that determination to get there? And yeah. it, it, it just astounds me, really. Yeah, I mean, my mom, at that time, I don't think she knew so much about soccer. Obviously, she knew the sport, but yeah. she wasn't so into it. So it was kind of weird how I got into it because, like, we didn't really have so much family around us. So it was like, I couldn't say my uncle or my cousin, like, play club or, you know, they were doing something with soccer at a young age. So I didn't really have something like that to kind of be like, I want to be like him or yeah. You know, my family did this. I wanted to follow that. So it was just one of those things where I just fall into soccer and it was history from there. So, Jesus, again, super excited to have you. Um, you told me a little bit about your background. Um, we had a little baby crying right now. Yeah, we did. We had to cut that. Just got to let everyone know <laughs> this isn't an edited <laughs> version of Jesus this is, Gonzalez. Yeah, this is raw. This is raw. This is real. This is, this is great. Um, and pretty much... Uh, yeah, you told me a little bit about your background, your drive, how to get to that professional level. Um, how? Tell me a little bit about your soccer career now as a professional. I know you played for Atlanta. Yes, was, that, was your first, that was your first pro contract. Professional. Kinda, yeah. I, I, that look. If you go on w w Wiki. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Wikipedia. Look, what it has on Wikipedia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what happens if you don't write your own story. Yeah. People start writing it for you. 
and that's how I have to get to the source okay. to know exactly what happened. Um, so tell me about your first contract, wow. how you signed it, where you signed it, and what was going through your mind. Like, oh. dude, I'm... So a lot of people don't know this, <laughs> but when I was in high school, I had all these Division One schools yeah. contact me. Like, my goal was like, I'm from LA, UCLA, obviously like top school in soccer wise. So I want to do that. So not to be like saying I was the guy, but I was blessed enough to be one of the main players that all these D1 school had interest in. So since I was in so much into school and my grades was, wasn't the best, I barely graduated high school from Chino House. Oh, you know, just being honest, like I was <laughs> the smartest. But it was a choice that if I was to put my money into it, I wouldn't rent to D1 right out of high school. So I had this agent guy. His name was Hugo Salcedo. Well, he was an agent at the time. Now he works for FIFA. Oh, shit. I don't know how all this happened, but I think it was all around because of Club and Sharif and him kind of like guiding me through, you know, ins and outs. I was, he was in my, I guess my life for a couple of months, yeah. weeks. And we got kind of close and he's like, I got this team for you. I'm an agent. I know what I can do for you. Are you interested? I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Where is it? Thinking MLS, you know, it was the big picture here. Yeah. He's like, Mexico. I'm going to take you to Mexico. And I'm like, okay. I just graduated high school. I'm just 17 years old. So my mind is like, I've never really been to Mexico, like, <laughs> so I don't know what to expect. Right. But it's like, obviously, my support system was like, go for it. I went to Mexico, I went to Monterrey, and I went to travel for Tigres. Tigres. Tigres, yeah. Damn. So I remember it was like two weeks that I had to go for trial, and Tuca was the coach Tuca? for the youth. Tuca Ferretti. Yeah. Wow. So he was my he was my coach for my age, which is the sub-17. So I go in there and not expecting anything. Like, I'm just, all right, you know, Mexico, here here I am. And I remember they used to call me Zurdo. Zurdo, because <laughs> I'm a lefty. Yeah. So my Spanish wasn't the best. So Zurdo, Zurdo. And I think within a week, Tigres offered me a contract for three years. Three years? Three years at the age of 17. Oh, shit. So that was, like, my official first contract ever. So that's why a lot of people don't know. Like, you know, I played in Mexico. I was out there. Um, at one point, America was interested in me. They wanted me to go with them, but I couldn't because I didn't have my double citizenship. Oh. And in order to get that, I had to have my father signature. And at that time, I had no contact with him. Oh, wow. So I tried to reach out different ways, but I couldn't to get just all I needed was a signature. I would have got my double citizenship. America would have took me in. Oh, shit. And I would have been playing for America if that was the case. But Mexico wow. Tigres was my first official contract. First official contract. First official contract. Wow. See, Wiki, Wikipedia doesn't say that. Yeah. We got to update that. <laughs> I mean, I don't really pay too much attention because I feel like a lot of things on my Wikipedia is not... Not accurate? Not accurate. Just or, so you know, everyone, it's not accurate. So it's not accurate. You're reading Wikipedia online. It's not accurate. It's not accurate. You heard it here it, first. It's not updated, <laughs> nothing, but at the same time, because yeah. I'm very personal, so I don't really like... Private, yeah. Yeah, so I, you told I, me. I remember telling somebody that was working for like the internet, I was like, can you delete this and that, blah, blah, blah. And they did, but the only reason why is because when I got back from Tigres, I went to Portland. Okay. Portland Timbers, that was my second contract that was offered. And they were at the time they were USL. The last year they would play USL before merging to MLS. So I went there with some other agent. He took me in. I remember my contract at, was it 19, I think? I was going to make 1350 a month plus apartment what? USL. And I was like, let's do it. <laughs> but... A lot of people didn't show Wait, 1300 me. Wait, 1300 or 13,000? 13, no, 1350. Oh, 1350. Okay. So I'm going to put it this way. In first year in uh, not America Tigres, my contract for my first year was 3500 a month. What? Staying at the Casa Club. So all that pocket money was going straight to my pocket. 
not nothing to spend you know yeah, 17 everyone. i'm barely becoming a doll learning how to like do what are you gonna spend it on yeah <laughs> so i remember they offered my second contract and i was like you know coming from mexico blah blah, blah i don't want to do but i was just being stubborn so then i came back when they got to the mls and they took me in but they took me as the u23s so that was a pdl team and I was still getting paid, but it wasn't like nothing crazy. But I was doing well enough to start going with the first team. So I started traveling with the first team, playing with the reserves, playing friendly. Like, and that took a while to kind of like realize like I can't just always have it my way. So it kind of just yeah. took me back to like I should have done everything with Mexico with Tigres, but I had it all to come to the U.S. and realizing that Mexico and U.S. like it's not the same. Yeah. You know, money wise, contract wise, the way they treat you, you know, soccer in Mexico was like, I, I felt like it was higher than MLS. Right. Because it was MLS, I feel like it was still picking up. And they didn't show a lot of Hispanics love like they do in Mexico. Yeah. So uh, I, yeah, that's another thing that's not on my Wikipedia, but that's actually something that did happen and it's just not on it. So we're going to have to add that on there. We're going to. I mean, we could, <laughs> but you know, I don't. I don't pay attention to that. You know, yeah. I know who I am, and it's you know, I feel like now is what people need to know about me more than what I've been through, and I just have the experience. So Tigres, Tigres, America, Port America, Portland, Portland. The following year, I went to Seattle. Seattle. Sigi Smith was a coach, and he knew me because of Sharif. Oh, really? So he knew like. You know, Sharif developed some great players, but I took my meniscus in preseason, so they kind of sent me back home. Okay. Where it's like, didn't know how injuries worked, thinking he's going to keep me, and but it wasn't the case. But that's kind of wild to think that an injury is going to set you back, and yeah. you know, you're going to, you, you can literally have the best career, and then one injury later, you're sitting sideline, and you yeah. see that all the time with like professional athletes in all levels yeah and they really don't care almost like you're, you're, you're they, they don't you don't have a, <laughs> we don't have a use for you what yeah are you? you don't even know what to do it's yeah. like the only thing that was weird about it was that at that time mls teams were able to take your rights away from other mls teams so if i wanted to i couldn't gone to another mls team but they couldn't sign me because i was under seattle sounders oh so siggy smith had a plan for me but that plan never happened. Wow. So I, I was stuck from going elsewhere. So I was like, all right, I can come back. But that was a fail. Like, that didn't happen. So what happened after Seattle? After that, I went, I did Open Cup, the U.S. Open Cup with Eric Ronaldo with Cal FC. Okay, so you went from Seattle to Cal FC. Yes, that, that time I was just coming back home, didn't know what to do. Like, I was trying to figure out if I should work or, you know, I didn't. College wasn't a thing for me because I felt like I was out of the picture. Yeah. And the whole Cal FC happened. So my name was mentioned to Ronaldo. And he kind of just brought me in randomly. And I didn't even know who the guy was. Yeah. But I was like, all I heard was, I'll pay you to play. <laughs> okay, let's do it. He said the key words. Yeah. I'll pay you to play. And so then... I was like, of course, I'll play. Yeah. And I, obviously, I found out who Eric Ronaldo was. Yeah. So I was like, this is another stepping stone if I want to get back into playing at a yeah. higher level. So that's that's what happened right after Seattle and went from Cal FC. So Cal FC, dude, it, I feel like a lot of people, especially in the community here in like SoCal, just either know someone that played in Cal FC, mm -hmm. played it. I think I played one of their reserve, like away yeah. games, like yeah. just because just they needed players and they were like, hey, do you want to play? Yeah. And I was like, yeah, sure, why not? Like. I play all the time, so and I know like you know I'm sure you know Mikey and yeah of course and they're like you want to play I was like yeah sure I'll go play why not but you went from really one of the biggest teams in Mexico Tigres yeah. to almost America to S Seattle Portland Portland then, then Seattle, Seattle and then you're playing at Cal FC which is was like a amateur, amateur team, team yeah. at the time right and the biggest noise at the time was oh damn Cal FC. They made it to the thing Lam fifth round. Yeah, it was like fifth round, Lamar Hunt Cup, yeah. and you guys 
beat, beat them? them. The first amateur team to beat an MLS team. Yeah, dude, that's huge. That's yeah, that's crazy. And you were a part of that. I was part of it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's where you. That was like the pinnacle. I feel like for yeah. the LFC. I think for time. everybody and even that yeah even now like people still speak about it yeah reference that point where you know you have this big open cup and yeah you have a chance to play against some professional players at a, and you're an amateur yeah and dude that's crazy so where do you go after Kelsey's done I mean I know after that I think so I think after that hmm so we did the Open Cup run, and everybody was making noise. Like, Cal FC, Eric Ronaldo's team, who was these players, blah, blah. And after we beat Portland Timbers in overtime, it was shocking to the world, you know, because we played at Portland, at their stadium, in front of the fans. And I think at that, that time, Portland was, like, a really good team. Like, really good team, yeah. They started off kind of, kind of like, slow, and they picked it up. So when we met them, they had, like, the full roster team. <laughs> <laughs> so it was for us, it was like we just beat an actual first MLS team and they're a bunch of amateurs, but in reality, most of us already played elsewhere. Yeah. It's just a lot of teams didn't take a chance on us anymore. Right. So Eric bought these teams, these players together. Yeah. So after that, Eric went out, they got the job at Atlanta, Atlanta Silverbacks. So he took players from our team to Atlanta and mind you, I wouldn't say these players were better than, you know, some of us. But he took those guys because they were his boys. Ooh. So we kind of got stuck and we kind of like left behind. So I remember against Portland, like I just got finished playing again uh, in Portland. So it was personal for me. Oh. So Eric was like, I'm going to sign this, this. I'm going to take you. And I'm like, all right, I'm waiting. He signs these guys. And I'm still waiting. And it turns out I'm like one of the last ones. Yeah. But it's like, how is this possible? So I was like, you know what? I need somewhere to train. I hit up one of my friends. He's like, I'm, gonna train. I'm training at Mount Sac. The coach is good. Great soccer. You come and train. All right, cool. I'm going to go train. It's close to me. And I guess the Mount Sac coach knew me from high school. And he saw me come in. We talked a little bit. And they enrolled me to go to Mount Sac without me knowing. <laughs> so a week later, the coach is like, hey, I know you got nowhere to be. Like, we enrolled you in school. Yeah. You know, play for us this year. I'm like, well, I wasn't planning on doing what? college and like that. So yeah, it all worked out because I played that year. We won state and nationals, and we went undefeated. Wow. So that was like kind of like – the thing between Eric hit me at once I started Mount Sac. He's like, I got a contract for you the last two months. Uh, we need to make playoffs. I need you to come out. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to do that. Like, I'm going to try to go back to school and take advantage of it. But I went to Mount Sac and took all PE classes <laughs> first semester, obviously, because I was, I was enrolled last, uh, like the last minute. So I did my first year and I was like, you know, back again to D1 schools hitting me up and I'm like blah 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 like yeah I want to do it but I wasn't taking the right classes and then it goes back to season's over I have a great season we just won and it's like what what's next the throw yeah the, this... and it's like you got to do this school and this class and this and this to try to transfer I'm like that's a lot of courses like a lot of classes I can't so I kind of it kind of fell off because I quit soccer. You quit soccer? Like, I quit soccer without nobody knowing. I just gained so much weight, I didn't want to play anymore. No what year was this again? This was 2012. 2012, okay. Yeah, 2012, because it's like, oh, you didn't do the summer school, you can't go to, you can't play the second year at Mount Sac. All right, well, I'm not going to play no more. And that's when I hit, like, about 200 pounds. And 200? Was, yeah, 200 pounds. Dude, that's big. That was huge. <laughs> and it's like, well, I can't do anything anymore. So it was like, M Mount Sac was like, we want you to come back. Like, And I guess this is illegal, but our coach went to all my classes that I failed or didn't take yeah. and put that I took them, passed it. If I had a failing grade, the switches to a passing grade. Yeah. So all that was happening when I didn't want to play. And they made that happen so I can play my second year. 
and then they keep hitting me up like you're <laughs> clear come play and i didn't want to no more yeah so i remember showing up like two weeks before preseason started i'm like okay i'll come play did my second year at mount sac i was their captain we won state so i was back-to-back champs oh shit and it was like something where i fell in love again like i had to lose weight try to play again at a higher level towards the end of the season like it was one of those things like i'm here i'm back where i need to be and finished the season one and i was like all right cool i'm back to atlanta then i go to atlanta sign my contract finally after missing a whole year because you know i decided to go to school but obviously one season was over i didn't take school seriously so i these D1 schools, like, I can't bring you in, blah, blah, blah. So I went back to Atlanta, ended up signing over there without Eric Ronaldo knowing. So he was, like, kind of shocked, like, you went to Atlanta, you didn't tell me, and you signed. So he ended up coming back that year to coach, basically, Cal FC all over again. So that's where I was at for two years with Atlanta. This is 2012. 2014? 2012 and a 2012 13 and season 14. 14 i didn't go back oh, okay for because eric left okay so yeah so it's two years though two years two with, years in atlanta how'd you like atlanta it's home it's home it's home. yeah wow. i always tell everybody that's yeah. my second home that's... it's like la but slower pace slower pace less traffic you have the same thing like hollywood melrose stuff like that in atl so it's that's like that's where all the rappers come from yeah right all of them <laughs> but it's like a lot of people don't see it that way like it's not cold all the time you get like four seasons in one day but it's like it's so nice out there everything is green so it's like home to me i want to go back to atlanta every time i get a chance i go back you buy property over there for yeah for, for cheap. cheap for cheap you can buy a home buy like a house. here yeah. <laughs> seven hundred thousand over there like 300 yeah and you get the same amount yeah that's that's home that's what i hear you can buy like a five bedroom and you're yeah for like 200 you're set that's crazy i can't can't wait to get out no i'm just kidding <laughs> i'm not gonna leave la hey, i <laughs> support you if you go out there visit. <laughs> but um dude so atlanta 2012 you come out of 13 you come out of mount sac mm-hmm. you won two state championships back to back two state well, the school won four back-to-back states. Wow. In those four years, there's two national titles as well. Okay. So my first year, we won their second national title. Okay. Which was kind of like historic in, in a junior college because we went undefeated the whole year. Oh, wow. Preseason, tournament, league, and then obviously state and nationals. So and we were ranked number one, I think, that year. Wow. So Mount Sac is, was known for like I was gonna say soccer like, for like you always hear Mount Sac and you're like yeah. they have a team yeah like for sure they have a team somehow some way mm-hmm. but um so you went to Mount Sac then you go to Atlanta, Atlanta so and then you're what happens at the end of the season there you're thinking so after my contract was up it's kind of weird because it back and goes back to like the beginning of the whole Cal FC run. The, I remember our last game of season was in Edmonton, in Edmonton, and I'm in my room with with one of my teammates, and the GM comes into our room just because he's our GM was like super friendly and he was a good person. So he comes back he's like, "Hey, what do you think about signing again?" I'm like, "I would love to. I want to come back." Yeah. Perfect. We're gonna sign you. Go home, enjoy your off season, and we'll talk about contracts again. So it was weird because we got kind of started talking a little bit. And against the game against Portland, that GM was watching our game. And at the time, he told Eric, like, who's this and this? I want those two guys first to bring to Atlanta. So it was me and Pablo Cruz. Oh, and obviously, shit. Pablo Cruz is from Pasadena. Yeah. So that's like we Local grew up legend. together. Yeah. If another I'm not legend. Mistaken. <laughs> so we were like, we were, he was my roommate in yeah. Atlanta. So we were like, what? It's like, yeah, I wanted you two to sign with us first, but Eric brought these guys instead. So we're like, and it like all makes sense why we were one of the last ones. So it, he told me, I'm going to sign you. I go home. They get a new coach. His name was Gary Smith, I believe, and he cleared out the whole team. He ended up staying with two players from Atlanta that were the years before. So he brings out his own, like, 
Scottish players and older guys, and it's like one of the things where you wait so long yeah. to get your contract, but then it turns out the GM gave the the coach all his power, so I was left out without a team wow. in 2014. Yeah. So I my whole thing was I'm gonna go back to ATO, and that didn't work out, so I was stuck in the middle of like. Well, what's next? Like, all these teams already have their roster. I don't have an agent. Who's going to want me now? Or the money's not going to be there, so it's kind of tough. So what'd you do? What? I think that year I went to play PDO in, in Indiana. Indiana? I think it was that year, 2014. And it was a weird situation because it was the first year starting up. You, I was getting paid to play PDO, but I was being housed by... But other families. Okay. So I had a host mom. What? So I was there for like three months. Such a like East Coast thing. Yeah. Like so it was kind of weird. Mom and like. But it, it was like, <laughs> I didn't want to do it because it's PDF, but I was like, I'm going to take it. One, because I want to play. Two, I have family in Indiana. So it was like, it gives me a reason to be even closer. I can go see them every weekend or every other weekend then once a year or stuff like that and my father was at the time he was living there oh really so I was like maybe I can kind of just have my family pick me up take me to their home and kind of work something out with my dad kind of like visit him yeah. you know talk to him so face to in, face he was in Indiana yeah wow but I don't know if he still does now okay because I haven't spoken to him for like three years I think three, three. four years if we spoke on the phone but I mean, my whole family asked me, "Hey, how's your dad? Have you talked to him?" I'm like, I don't know. I know as much as you know, which is nothing. Yeah. So that's the only reason why I went and played PDL out there, because my family and obviously I was trying to be closer to my dad. And they're just like, if I want to go see him, like I'm able to see him. But I probably see him in those three months, probably like twice. Twice. And I've been like in his side area for my family, like every other weekend. So there was like those things where I was kind of hurt because I was like, I'm going to see him. He calls me, yeah, come Sunday because that was his day off. But when I was there, no phone calls. He wouldn't pick up, like nothing. So it was yeah. kind of like one of those situations was like, well, I took this because I want to be closer to you and my family. Yeah. But Same I guess it's just you're still out of the picture. I'm just being with my family, which kind of made things a little bit easier for me than kind of be like all sad about you know, being disappointed in the way, you know. Yeah. So that's what I did. I think 2014 was the year I played. It was, it wasn't the best, but you know, I sacrificed just to be closer to family. Yeah. No, family is definitely very important. Yeah, especially yeah. that I'm super close to them. Kind yeah. of like my only aunt that I have with my cousin. So it's, it's something that I got to go see him. You know, they left probably like over 10 years ago. So I see him every time I travel over there or I buy my ticket and go over there. But it's like, my aunt is like the best. So it's like, I will do this for you guys and whatever happens here with soccer, doesn't matter because I'm going to be you know, closer to you guys. So that yeah. was the only reason why I went over there. So this is like, I, so like 2014, 2015, that's literally when I, when I started like Vida Casio, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I know as soon as I started, like you, Vita Casio, by the way, is the football life, and it's Italian for uh, that's well, it's Vita Casio. <laughs> Vita Casio is Italian for the football life, yeah. and I started it, and you immediately like started following it, started sponsoring it, and pretty much I feel like you reciprocated all the love that like what I had for Vita Casio yeah. and you were just like, like it's almost mine. <laughs> and like literally I was like, dude, this, this guy is sick. Like I didn't know you that well. Yeah. Like, like literally we were just, it's... you were just like, oh, well I followed you and I, you follow me back and you're like, this is sick. Yeah. Or, like I like what you're doing. And, and like literally it's like one of those creative things where you don't know if people actually like it yeah. and to have you like actually back it and yeah. someone that, from your background and, that actually appreciates the sport and like knows what I'm trying to do with Vita Calcio and the football life and kind of make it a platform for people to really um, express themselves. And this yeah. is what this podcast is for. It's like, it's not much more than 
really for us to have an outlet to really speak our minds mm-hmm. and not hold shit back. <laughs> yeah. Be like, oh, well, you said that wrong or yeah. you don't sound like everyone else on my podcast or anything like that. And and um, just going back to Vita Kausu, I feel like when I first started like sending you stuff, you were just going to sign to Las Vegas Lights. And you were, yeah. I think, playing for Cal, Cal United. Cal United, time, yeah. yeah, at the time. And I was like, what's Cal United about? Yeah, and like, I just had met you and they'd be like, I'm going to leave this. And and it was like, it was like a perfect storm. Like you were going to go to <laughs> Las Vegas Lights. And I'm like, yeah, I wear all my stuff. Yeah. It's going to be huge. And dude, obviously you had like minor setback at Las Vegas Lights. I, I didn't even know. Like until I saw one of the articles that you were in that accident. Yeah, it was an and I was accident. Like, Dude, you were in an accident. Like, that's crazy. How, that's not even an injury. It's like yeah, it's like a life changing moment. Exactly. And I'm like, dude, like, what? What exactly? Like, what? What happened? Like, when you went from Cal United, like, walk me through playing with Cal United. Is it Cal United? Or yeah, Cal United. Because they're they're UPSL team. No, they're now NISA. Oh, they joined the new pro league, NISA. Okay, so yeah, so now they're a NISA team, and at the time they were a UPSL team. Yeah, they correct? were UPSL, yeah. And they were contenders, yeah. like biggest rivals with um, Cal FC and well, within. I think Cal FC was Cal FC was playing UPSL for second, like the lower division. Oh, I see. So we were in the higher ranks. Gotcha. So the only reason why I joined them was because Eric Ronaldo was was the head coach. Oh, okay. So at, when I first started with Cal United, they were LA Wolves. Oh, I see. And they were playing at uh, UPSL. And then LA Wolves kind of started making noise because they were supposed to join NASL that, like within a year or so. So Eric took over, brought his players, brought me in. So we kind of started playing UPSL. I didn't even know what that was. I didn't know what it was until yeah. recently. Yeah, so it was just kind of like, okay, well, I'm going to follow your lead. You're going to be the coach. They're going to be pro, NSL. I'm all in. Like, I want to play again. And he's like, okay, cool. So it turned to LA Wolves, OC Invicta, and then Cal United. When we came to Cal United, when Nada decided to run for president for the U.S. Federation, so he kind of left all of us with Cal United. Mm. So it was kind of like, again, you're leaving, you know. And then... NSL folded that year so we were kind of like well we wasted three years with you well with this club and that's not even pro and that was the whole plan so I stayed with Kai United Eric ended up signing to Las Vegas Lights okay so I was finishing that whole year it was uh, 2018 so I was finishing that year and since Eric left took the job in Vegas then I'm getting a new coach so this is kind of like weird because I went up to the East Coast to visit family. I come back, they get a new coach thinking everything's back to normal, you know, come back to training. And that's it. And the coach was like, kind of like behind my back telling the gym, like, I don't like him. He's not good enough. So I didn't know about it until like probably like two weeks after I came back, basically cut me. Oh, shit. So he said, you're not good enough for, to play for my team. I was like, what is going on? Like, how do you gonna say I'm not good enough when you bring your? He brought some players that were his. You gonna tell me this guy's better than me? Like in my head, like. So I was like, all right, cool. I got called up, Eric. I was like, I just got cut from a UPSL team. It's like, all right, don't worry. Like, I'm gonna take you to my to Vegas with USL. Just hold off this whole like the thing was like two and a half months left before he able to sign players. And then November 30 happens, Friday, my accident. November 30th. November 30th. Damn. It happened like around 2 something in the afternoon. I was working. I was delivering packages for a good friend of mine that was kind of like a Sunday league coach. So he was paying <laughs> me to play and work for him to make extra money. Yeah. So I went to Vegas. I'm like, yeah, cool. So that happened. Get ran over. I go to the hospital like around 11, almost midnight, because I was in Upland. So my head was cut open. My whole left side was like bruised up, like scratches. My I was wearing sweats, all ripped up, shirt was ripped up. 
and I was actually wearing one of your shirts. Shut the fuck up. I swear, I was wearing Shut one of your shirts. Shut the fuck up, dude. That is... I was wearing one of your shirts working. And the only reason why is I said that is because I just saw the... It's crazy. Is that one, but the all black one. All black and this, yeah. And then the bag is all ripped up. <laughs> but I still wear it. But it was I was wearing that shirt. Damn. And I, I suffered a concussion. When I got to the hospital, I found that I had a grade three concussion. Yeah. Which kind of lost memory and like of what happened. Uh, I couldn't drive, so I had one of my friends pick me up and drive me to Pablo's house. He drove me home, so I got to the hospital like around 11 minutes once my mom got home from work. Dude, you got to the hospital. Like hours later. Yeah, I was going to say, dude, you had a concussion. Yeah, like I, my leg I ran over, like I bumped my head, like it was bad. Like That's crazy. But my mind was like, I got to get up, like I can't be here, like we got to call the ambulance, don't call them, like. I'll be fine. Give me some time. So they, I had a friend pick me up, take yeah. me to like 30 minutes to Pablo's house. He drove me home. But when I got to the hospital, Pablo called Eric Ronaldo. He's like, hey, his first guy ran over. He got into an accident, blah, blah, blah. He's like, is he okay? He's like, I don't know. He's going, he's going through the whole thing. Yeah. And I got out of the hospital. gave me medication. I couldn't walk. Like, from here down to my leg was all bruised up, cut up. My head was dented. Like, it's crazy. Dude. So I was trying to, like, walk and f- figure out what was going to happen. I think a week later, uh, everybody, the, like, the word spread out. So everybody's calling me. And the assistant coach calls me. And he's like, hey, blah, blah, blah. And I guess somebody, I'm not going to say names, but somebody spread a rumor that I was out drinking. Oh, shit. Because it happened on a Friday. I got to the hospital at midnight. So kind of like, not even in my own city, you know? Yeah. So that was the rumor that got spread out and got back to Eric. and was like, you know, I can't sign you. Like, you got to get healthy first. Second of all, I can't have nobody um, on my team that's drinking and getting into problems like that. So that was like the rumor. And it kind of just took away my contract because I was going to sign before season started. That is crazy, dude. So, like, around December, everybody was signing contracts. I'm like, hey, I'm, like, walking again. Like, will you sign me? He's like, yeah, don't worry about it. The assistant coach, like, I don't know what to tell you. Blah, blah, blah. So, preseason starts, no contract. So, he's like, come to preseason. Let's see if you can still play. Let's see how your foot is, blah, blah. I was like, what about my contract? He's like, can't. Let's see if you can still play, and then I'll sign you. So, there I go. A week after, I'm able to run. I show up to preseason, doing all this crazy fitness. I'm overweight. I'm like hitting like 200 pounds again. The drugs that I was taking, the, well, the medication was had me like on a whole different level. Yeah. Every morning I was throwing up when I was in Vegas. Damn. Trying to lose weight, trying to prove to Eric and the assistant coach like I still got it. Like some of my teammates, I played with Kyle United. Okay. So they half of the team knew who I was and how I played. So. There was like no question, like, Sticky. what's he doing here? You know, yeah. they know the that I got into an accident, so they're all pushing for me, rooting for me. I'm doing double days, triple days with the assistant coach, getting myself back. Probably there for like a month and a half. Eric hits me up, says, "I can't sign you. Go back home." What the fuck? It's like, there's no money. That's crazy. So I'm like, you telling me I did all this for nothing? So I, it's like, but stay in shape, keep working, I'm going to bring him back. So I go back home, like, what am I going to do? Like, where am I going to work? I can't. There's nothing. And then Open Cup happens again. He needs players. Calls me up. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm not going to take that. Like, the money was like, like I can do that in, in a week. Yeah. You know? But my mind was like, I need to play. I want to be back in the map. Kind of prove myself that I can be a pro again and still compete and and be me, like everybody knows. But I go back and sign. We we do the run. I end up losing more weight and being in shape. Starting games and it's like I'm doing well. And then I think I made my debut a week. The next week, I end up starting. The following week, I ended up scoring my first goal. The Golasso? Yeah. <laughs> so I ended up doing yeah, that within like a month yeah. of just me working hard. So everything was kind of like paying off. 
Yeah. So I'm like, I'm on top of the world again, yeah. like, scoring my first goal. Like, what else? Like, you know, kind of like, it's just a blessing. Like, all, all these months that I've been through, it was kind of like tough. And when I scored my first goal, was my mom was visiting her sister in the East Coast with her husband. And it was the first time they all sat together and watched one of my games live in TV. Wow. So that game that they were all together I ended up scoring my first goal. And it was just like one of those things was like how crazy life works. You know, I have my family over here rooting for me and I ended up scoring. So it was like one of those moments that I had. But then after that, I was like peaking. Yeah. It went back down downhill. Eric Ronaldo was treating me like I was nobody. I mean, after that game, yeah, because the next game we had a break, like two weeks off. We went on a weight trip to play against Tacoma, Seattle, which was Seattle Sounders, like second team. Because you guys had, if I remember correctly, the. The season was a little up and down. Yeah. It wasn't like wins, losses, yeah. close games. I saw a few of the games on ESPN Plus. Mm-hmm. And I was like, dude, they, they just kind of like escaped. And yeah. And I was like, like, where do you kind of go from here? Like, you know, like, but there you go. I guess it's like you said, it's like a roller coaster. And after you had that big win, yeah. then it went back downhill. So, it, I mean, I was. I, I'm going to just speak for the team. Yeah. Behind scenes, it wasn't the best. So when you would see us on the game, like, we were all happy. Obviously, everybody's happy to play a home or away game. Like, you know, you're doing what you love. But behind closed doors, it was just terrible. Like, owner-wise, and then the, the GM, and then the coaching staff. So it was just, like, if I was to be honest, I feel like our up and down scenes, it was because of that. Wow. You know, I think we made the best out of us being a unit and saying, you know what? They don't want to do this for us or they're going to treat us like that. Whatever. We're here to prove ourselves that we can play, compete. Like, we were doing it for ourselves. We didn't care about coaching staff, nobody. So I feel like it was kind of like up and down. And then after that that game, that score we played in the away game, I ended up getting a red card. So I started I and... People that know me, like, I'm very aggressive at times, but clean. But there's times where I just, they get the best out of me, and I forget that I'm playing. It's just one-on-one altercation with, like, okay, you did that. And I don't hold back. So I got a red card. And then after that, it was just kind of, like, down for me. Just Eric started treating me like I was a nobody. Like, you don't even belong here. Like, you haven't learned your lesson, you never grow up. I was like, for me, it was kind of personal because you kind of like, I grew up a little bit to this man that I am and you were there with me and all of a sudden you're acting like brand new, like that's not me. You know, we had several things starting from KFC. KFC, yeah. And it was like, I showed my true colors against Portland. I'm like, look, this captain, Jack Dewsbury was treating me like shit. When I was there, and I told Eric before the game started, I'm like, it's personal for me. Like, whether we win, lose, I'm going after this guy. And he didn't know me like that, so it's like, okay, kind of like weird. So in overtime, I, we were up one zeros, and extra time. So I, I looked at Eric, he looked at me, and I just nodded my head. I remember the goalie kicked it. He's right here next to me. I jump, and I just elbow him. Crack his head. I think he had like 10, 12 stitches, I think, that I opened them up. Oh, shit. So like, from that moment, Eric kind of knew if I had to be an aggressive player, like I'll do it in the smart way, not where it's so obvious. So when I got that red card against Tacoma, he kind of treated me like, you're never going to grow up, you know, blah, blah. So I never, I stopped seeing the field. Right. Until I started performing again, and I started starting, and then he was just kind of like, I got to let you go. Towards the last two months, he's like brought me into the office. I was already training in the field, kind of being out there early with the team. Brings me in. He's like, I gotta let you go. You're not gonna be part of this team no more. So it was kind of like shocking for me. It's like as soon as I was up here, it just went back down and it kept getting worse, worse, worse. And then got to a point where they released me. So let me get this straight. You you got the red card. 
and then you after the red card you hit someone in the head and then you gave him the stitches no so i got the the red card against tacoma okay right our goalie was got into a little altercation so i was kind of separate from everybody yeah this guy came up to me i shoved him yeah he came back at me hardest so i kind of shoved him with two hands it got to a point where i got him on the neck oh so he got to a point where it says i choked him okay so i got my red card but the guy that I elbowed was in the open cup run against Portland. Okay. So Eric was referring to that you're never going to grow up, you're never going to learn because of what happened in that run against Portland. I see. So it's like, this is the guy you met and you fell in love with. <laughs> yeah. And now that I'm doing it cleaner, yeah. defending our goalie that was getting attacked by like four or five guys, yeah. I was the only one that went up there. Gotcha. Now you're blaming me like, yeah, I shoved them harder. But I did not choke him, even though you can kind of see my hands going up. Yeah, so it's it's like one of those things where you where you where you have like an understanding, but then later on you're like, wait, we really didn't have an understanding. Yeah. Like, why did it change? Yeah. You know, it's kind of like a bait and switch almost in a sense. Yeah, and then after that, yeah. it was just like I was playing a little bit, and then I remember played in Tulsa. I started played yeah. a half, and that was it. Three games go by and. I don't even see the 18. I'm not even rostered, nothing. Then he brings me in. I got to let you go. Wow. I was like, okay. I didn't even walk into the I just walked down. like, all right, I'm out. Like, kind of was the, like the last straw for me. I was like, that's how you're going to treat me? After all we've been through and I never did you wrong, never said anything bad about you. Like, all right. It's like an un- unspoken thing. Yeah. Not necessarily like a band switch, but it's like unspoken that... We have each other's back. And yeah, like we're, we're going through a whole career path together, and and for him to like kind of almost turn his back on you. Yeah, because like, when Atlanta happened, that was his first coaching job. Wow. That's what he wanted to do. So we were all there with them. So it was like this bond. You know, he had players that were leaving him, and then he'll come to me like, "Hey, like this player said this about me. Like, what do you think about that? Should I just let him go?" And it's like, "Hey, I support you. Whatever. Like, yeah. You know, I had I had his back." All this time, and there was somebody always in my ear telling me, I don't trust him. Why you keep going back to him? I don't trust him. Yeah. And I was like, with soccer, like, I want to play. He tells me, like, I'm falling for it. And they kept saying, I don't trust him. He's going to do something again. And it was one of those moments where in Vegas, I was like, the last straw, I'm not going to deal with a person like that anymore. Like, we had our ups and downs, and I can be so mad at you and say this behind your back but i'd rather just let you know how i feel and you don't like it oh well like it has to be like that sometimes yeah i mean sometimes you just gotta do it yeah <laughs> that's 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 a wild story i mean so we went from your early years at Tigres, you you won all the way up you went through a car accident you you very well could have been dead, yeah. pretty much. Like I mean, in a way, but I feel like I not dead. <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to say dead, but I would say my career could have ended. <laughs> All right, that, that's a nice, that, yeah. that's like a very optimistic way yeah. of saying it. But yeah, I feel like sure. Okay, we'll go with that one. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, you scared me. Now. I know. <laughs> no, I mean like. You know, with accidents, obviously, yeah, that's yeah. why it's called an accident. Like, you just don't know which way it's yeah, going to go. And, exactly. And um, you went through a very big accident, and then you end up playing in Las Vegas Lights. You go through a season that's rocky, and, you know, like, I'm out here, like, looking at it, like, from the outside perspective. Yeah. And it looks like it's a sweet deal. Yeah. Like, you're playing Las Vegas, you're USL. Um you you got it out of Pasadena. Yeah. You're making money. You're about to. I'm thinking you're gonna go pro next, and yeah. like no, you're cut. Like that's crazy. And and the way I understand it is you have USL is like a stepping stone to the MLS. Yeah. And then that's it. You made it. You've, you're you're a professional. And from there you carry on as you know as a professional and yeah. you do professional things like you, yeah. you know you play xyz amount of years you you build a career the maybe you get a statue i don't know <laughs> like depending on how big yeah. you become you know and or you end up coaching with within that club and and that's how i see like mls progressing um i feel like it's a little different like as far as like in mexico like you're 
it was a very different path. Yeah. But at the same time, it's it's where you were taken, and now you're back in LA. I'm back in back home. And and the reason why I'm bringing up the whole MLS USL everything is because now it's Nisa. Yeah. Which what is Nisa like? I t- explain it to me and like everyone because it's like I I always thought it was just MLS USL Nisa. Maybe USL one. I don't know. Yeah. Throw UPSL and NASL in there, and we have like a mix of like different mm-hmm. leagues. And I'm just like, oh shit! Like, <laughs> how do I like, you know, how do I like really strategic? Like, how do I put these in like steps? Like from yeah. one, two, three, four, five. Like, how do you do that? And well, I feel like MLS is everybody knows MLS. It's like Division One Pro, and it's. You know, you got Galaxy, LAC, New York, like all those big teams. So that's been around. And then USL has always been in the picture where USL and NSL was upcoming, upcoming years yeah. ago. Like, I mean, mind you, Portland Timbers in USL and Seattle Sounders were like in USL. So it's like US, USL is a league that's coming up, but it's becoming its own pro league. It is. So it's like MLS doesn't want to affiliate with nobody else. Like they don't want to do promotion relegation. So that was out of the picture. So all these new leagues are like, well, we're going to be pros. We're going to be second division. We don't care about MLS anymore. We're going to continue to build soccer in the U.S. and add more teams that can't afford it. But they have fans in cities that they need a sport like that. Yeah. So USL came in the picture, which is growing. And then Nisa came in the picture this past year. It was his first season ever with like six teams. It was kind of like West and East, but they never played against each other. So you just play your own your own conference, West and and the East. Yeah. So now that it's a bigger, more teams are joining. It's becoming a league where it's going to be like the USL. Sure. So it's a new pro league. Owners have a chance to kind of just buy in. And have a pro team in their city and just kind of expand soccer everywhere. Because obviously you have in the major markets like New York, L.A., like Chicago. Obviously those are big cities, but you don't have them like in smaller states or cities where, you know, you feel like the community loves soccer. Like but maybe nothing... let's just say like Stockton, yeah. right? Where you just know people love soccer. Yeah. And, like... and there's nothing for there. So yeah. you kind of, the uh, owner wants to build a or team. Or Fresno. Yeah, Fresno. Or something like that, you know. So it's like Nisa has become this league where it's going to kind of follow the European leagues, kind of follow their the way they do things, kind of just make it more organized and just kind of help everybody understand, like, how soccer works in the U.S. Like, we're working to get better, but if MLS is not going to help us develop, then we're going to do these leagues and just kind of expand all over the United States and just – Hopefully it grows and you can still say you're a pro athlete. Maybe from Nisa you can go to MLS. From Nisa you can go to USL. From this league you can go to Europe. So it's like we're growing, but that's what Nisa is really about. That's very interesting because I I didn't even really know what Nisa was, or even USL for that matter, until I started watching you play and obviously took more interest in the USL and – and I think that just speaks to the growth of the sport itself within the U.S. Like where yeah. your friends play somewhere, you're like, oh, shit, like I want to watch it now. Yeah. But wait, like this platform wasn't even there before. And, it, and if you even think about the MLS, it started in 1996, no somewhere in the 90s. Let's just say somewhere. Yeah. Let's just say if it was 1991. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it was after the World Cup in 96. But let's just say that. The MLS hadn't even started. What? What? What makes them so superior? What? Why? You know, like why even follow them? Why don't I just watch USL instead? It it, it really all comes down to yeah. marketing, of course, really, and just to them bringing big players and things like that. And um, I forgot my point because I <laughs> I had a really good point in my head right now, but it it has something to do with the MLS and. For, well, I guess it comes down to the MLS being cocky, really. It's like, dude, how, why do you want to? Why are you guys going to separate yourself from USL yeah. and and NISA when you guys were just 
just started. It's not like you yeah. you were here like in 1900s and like, yeah. oh man, like we're the MLS, we've been here forever. You just found out that soccer is popular and it's going to make you a shit ton of money after yeah. you saw that the World Cup brought in the highest revenue. I don't, I'll fucking look it up later, <laughs> right? But the yeah. World Cup, I mean, you sold out the Rose Bowl to an Italy versus Brazil game, yeah. over 100,000 tickets. And now you're realizing, oh shit, th- there's money to be made. And that's why they want to cut off someone like Nisa or USL because it's going to bite into it yeah. but it's not going to bite into it that's a that's a reality it's 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 a sport that's growing and by growing there's people who were never soccer fans are yeah. turning into soccer fans because we have players like you for yourself that pretty much come from Pasadena and tell people about the sport and you show them what the sport is and yeah. they follow teams like Las Vegas Lights that I would have never followed before <laughs> And that's just a reality of it. Yeah. It's, it's, it. It's like it. There's something for someone for everybody. Yeah, of and 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 this podcast is the definition of that because you know someone's gonna listen to it. It might not hit every tone and tone yeah. that everyone wants to hear. And like, oh, dude, you guys aren't fucking flowing or whatever. <laughs> but there's gonna be some relevance in there. Yeah. And at some point, we're gonna be we're gonna chisel this podcast down to a T and then they're like, oh, well, yeah, there's there's money to be made there. Let's yeah. let's sponsor this podcast or, you know, let's let's put our money there. And then, or, you know what, forget that podcast. I'm gonna start a side podcast. And yeah. really, my goal is not really to evolve into that position where I'm like, I say fuck anything. I, I wanna be a part of whoever welcomes it, you know, whoever is, is really the same energy. Yeah. And that's really my goal of this podcast where, we have people with the same energy, same output, and we're putting the same input, and we're getting a message across that kind of correlates to everything is going up, yeah. you know. And really, that's why I brought you on here because, dude, like your story, the past. We've been talking for an hour and ten minutes, dude, <laughs> <laughs> and I keep looking because yeah. I want to make sure my software's running and everything's going smooth, and everything we're saying is captured because yeah. you know I don't want to lose this energy and momentum because you think everything's going up and dude everything's fucking going up like seriously <laughs> like dude you started from a fucking point where you're like you're not supposed to go pro yeah you're not supposed to go anywhere really and and your skills your abilities are literally allowing you to open up the world for you and to keep going and progressing and you're 28, 28. and dude i'm 34 you have at least I feel like another six more years before you know like before you even think about being in this position where like oh I don't want to play yeah. anymore and then so like where do you go from there like you you're gonna be 28 you're now playing in LA Force in LA Force so tell me something about well before we talk about the LA Force let me just keep going with everything's going up because you literally grew up without a father which is a hundred percent tough yeah like i sometimes i grew up with both parents and like when my father like i always say like oh well fuck my dad worked every day yeah but like he would still be back home at the end of the day like right and then you think like well he wasn't never really there like so yeah. getting this like, like whiny ass voice like oh well he wasn't like always there and i'm like dude but your dad was never there yeah and then you found a way through like you found it through coaching you found it through soccer soccer is a very like I don't know if people understand, but you really have to focus in soccer. Like you focus, you either focus on ninety minutes or you let up five yeah. ten minutes, and someone scores a goal on you. That's how you know when you lost your focus. Yeah. When someone scores a goal on you, like last minute, right? And and that's because exactly because you lost concentration, you lost your focus, or you weren't training hard enough yeah. to keep that focus. And literally, you you've been playing so long that you've built up yourself to be here. And now you're out of Vegas. You went through all these crazy fucking stories. <laughs> like, seriously, I think they're crazy. Yeah. I, I don't I mean, it's tough, but, like, I feel like a lot of people, just because you're a pro athlete, they think none of this stuff happens to you. Right. But we're all humans. Like, I'm not saying I'm, a, like, a Messi, Cristiano Ronaldo type of player, but, like, I'm still living the dream where I'm getting paid to do what I love, but it wasn't easy. Like, yeah. And here in the States, it's like, you got to go to college. You know, when, when I was hitting 18, 19, teams were like, what university do you go to? 
I didn't go to university. I went straight from high school. But here is like, uh, well, we want we have this guy that's playing here, that went to this school, and then he's gonna be this. Where I've already been to a different country, yeah. And I was offered a contract in Mexico, like that says more than a school. A school, yeah. But it's like it's not all butterflies and flowers because you're athletes. Like my story took me a different way, where I could have easily given up years ago exactly but i guess my circle and my support team i mean they know who they are but they want to keep pushing me and saying hey you're right there keep going don't don't tell people you're down false but don't tell them you're your highs so it's kind of like so i keep myself focused and kind of private in a way yeah but it's just like i just want to be me and if i can keep playing i'm gonna keep playing but just know there's something behind this and that to become where I'm at right now. So I feel like that's kind of like people get confused. They're like, you're not even supposed to be this person growing up. How do you come this or how do you achieve being a pro athlete? But it's just mine or matter. I don't need, I didn't need a father, no disrespect to him, but yeah. I didn't need a father to tell me this or that. Like, I had a mom that was playing the role off my dad. So I, in a way, I had both pictures, you know, but there was no excuse for me to say, well, grow up with one parent, I'm going to become a street person or, you know, become an alcoholic, drug addict. Like, my mind was still the same focus. Like, yeah. I got to help out who helped me. So this is my story and this is how I became me, in a way. Damn. Wow. So you pretty much, this is like, this is the goal of the, the podcast itself. Like you, you told everyone your story, mm-hmm. um, but not now you're back in LA and the story continues. So this is like one, almost like a either one, either one book and then in a series of books, or this is like one big chapter. Yeah. And I feel like, now your next chapter starts and you're playing for LA Force and are you are you allowed to speak about LA Force or I like, feel like what, I am, yeah, yeah where you where you're going or I mean I feel like you kind of hit it with the whole <laughs> chapter but I feel now that LA Force kind of just gave me this new life yeah I will say it's like a new book that I'm writing yeah so it gave me joy to play soccer it gave me happiness Gave me the passion again. Just kind of let LA Force give me this this platform to be myself again. Kind of just let me be me and play the way I want to play. So LA Force is a new team in NISA. We just lost in the final in PK to Cal United. Oh, really? In the first ever championship for NISA. So it's, you know, I feel like for me personally, I got unfinished business. So I ended up taking this this opportunity with LA Force to kind of just rewrite my my history. I want to take it more serious. I want to be in shape. Just kind of do things the right way because I've been through so much. I know what it takes, and I want to just take advantage of my last, what, three or four years, whatever I had playing, and just do it the right way and end my career on a positive note instead of ups and downs or just negativity. So yeah. LA Force just gave me that whole platform to be me. Dude, and you're at a prime age right now, like where you could ball out and yeah. still show the world like what you have, and that's great, dude. I'm I'm super excited to watch you. <laughs> I'm excited. I mean, it's been it's been a journey, but now I can say I can be proud of being an athlete in a way because I don't have to hide so much bullshit, <laughs> if you, to say the least, you know. Yeah. So LA Force is giving me that opportunity to. Just be happy and play yeah. without nobody telling me you did this wrong or you don't belong in this league or why you're still playing. You know, they just be you and we know you're going to do the right things on the field and we're okay with that. If you make mistakes, we don't care because we knew the right intention of that mistake. Are those are those games going to be televised, do you know, if, or if they're going to be on? I do not know yet. Okay. I mean, I know they're still trying to set up the schedule. Um, 
I'm trying to be involved as much as I can with with the league. Yeah. Just because our owners, I don't even know if this can be said, but our owners and part of Nisa, he's part of that whole creating this league. Okay. So he kind of tells us behind the scenes. And since I know people in the league or been around, like they give me the inside. Yeah. So everything's starting to come into a full picture. So this year, I would say by the end of the month, beginning of the next month, everything will be like set in stone with schedule, where the game's going to be televised or what app you can use or stuff like that, where you can see games or mm-hmm. keep up with just the league in itself. That's cool. Yeah, so, well, I mean, once I know the details, I mean, I want people to just follow the, this new league and obviously there's a lot of great players that are, are in this league, so. Yeah. T- like 10 years from now, like, do you see yourself playing like old older man leagues or are you going to transition at some point to like coaching and like I mean, you know, I would... having your kids play soccer and things like that or I mean in 10 years if I can still play for fun yeah. and I still love the game I will play you're going to play but I feel like coaching will be another thing I want to do kind of just give back to the younger kids and Cause that's what I got when I was a kid, you know. The manager that sponsored me was giving me everything, yeah. So I know how it feels to get the opportunity to play a club, because a lot of kids don't play because their parents can't afford it. So kind of just give them that that fun and soccer style that Sharif gave me, you know. Yeah. I knew I was playing club, but I will forget. It was just more fun for me than anything. Yeah. So I can see myself coaching little kids. I feel like the younger it's where it's at just because you kind of teach them a little bit of how to play soccer the right way. Obviously, if I have kids, I'm not going to force them to play, but you know, it's something that I would love to see them do. And hopefully if they're good enough or want to take it that far, do better than I did just because I know the ins and outs and I did a lot of mistakes and I don't want them to do the same thing that I did. So that, what's your biggest piece of advice for um, the future of soccer and kids? And mm. what, would, what would be like one biggest takeaway that you'd want to tell them? Like, like if the one thing you could tell them, like, what would it be? I feel like it's cliche because it's like common, but it's like if one door closes, there's always another one. But one advice, just playing wise, I guess I would give is. Just play like it's your last game because you never know who's watching. Damn. That's what happened to me. I was playing club, a Damn. tournament or league. Next thing you know, I have this youth national team having eyes on me that I didn't even know about. So when I was 15, I was playing for the youth national team. So if it happened to me, it could be happening to somebody else. But you're not having fun or playing like your last game. You don't know what you can do on the field. I feel like that's, I hope a lot of the kids realize like you can start from me, Villa Park, Mexican Sunday League, to playing club from club, doing the youth national team from the youth national team playing pros. Like, I wasn't expecting that, but I played every game like it was my last, like it was the final. Yeah. And it took me so far. And I mean, there's more for me to keep going. So I'm, kids can kind of just see the bigger picture instead of, Someone bashing on them like, oh, we just lost twenty to zero. Yeah, I'm not gonna be nothing. Like it happened to me, so it's it depends how bad you want it. But keep going. Somebody's there out there watching somebody, and if this coach doesn't like you, this other coach will. That's, and that's something the, that I learned. That's the thing about soccer too. It's like I feel like it's such a small community in mm-hmm. a sense. Like where I know someone's listening to this podcast, they're gonna be like. I know both of them. Like, yeah. <laughs> right? Shout like, out to you. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to whoever that is. And, and like, played with coaches like Sharif, where we both know Sharif. And, like, yeah. and, like, and just, just the type of pedigree that he pushes all the time. Like, like, if he, if, like, if he's like, I like that guy and I know he can play, yeah. I, I more than likely know how to play just like him, too, a little yeah. bit. And it's crazy. But, um, the soccer community being small and and I just want to like I have another question it's like it's is personal branding like 
important in soccer. Like, like I, like a Cristiano, like that's personal branding to the max. Like yeah. that's like the most maximum or like Messi, like, like maximum. That's, that's an extreme. But do you see that helping players in like NISA or in USL or anything like that? Like, do you see it being as important or do you think that it's doesn't um, really matter? Or? I feel like it does and it doesn't because I feel like I'm both in a way. Like, like I feel like I feel like soccer itself, the way you play, speaks for itself, and obviously uh, you as a human. But we gotta understand, like everybody comes from different backgrounds. You can't change somebody right away because <laughs> you know they're being this person, like. So I feel like it does matter, but it doesn't. Just depends how you represent yourself. Like I feel like when I feel like when I said it doesn't for me, it's like I don't show it as much, but I still remember that I'm a pro athlete and I gotta act like a pro. So I feel like nobody's gonna be Cristiano Ronaldo, Messi, but you can follow their footsteps. Yeah. And then from there you, it could work or it doesn't, but then your soccer skills and all that is going to just cover up whatever the person you are because you're just that talented. So what it sounds to me like is just stay true to yourself yeah. and play your game. And no matter what you are on or off the field, you're going to be known for your skills at yeah. the end of the day. Like I was telling you before they started, like, remember, I, I remain the same. I come as I, as I live. So it's like, I'm going to be the same person. Like I said, someone's going to like you and someone's not. Yeah. You can't please everybody. Like Eric Ronaldo loved me at one point. Now he's, we're kind of like up and down. Yeah. And now LA Forest loves me. So it's like that door closes and I have this new person that's appreciating the person I am. And I didn't have to change and be this person that everybody wants me to be. Yeah. So I, that's what I yeah. feel like. And that's where I live by and it's you don't have to always change but you know there's some things that you don't have to change but don't show it because I can tell you about this play does this and that but you see him on the field he's he's very respectful he's a pro he acts like a pro he trains like a pro but outside of that you, he's a different person <laughs> but that's the thing like they still being true to himself but he knows when to be serious and and take his job like it's his last. So it's very important to be professional on the field. Yeah, because I mean, outside the field, everybody's human. Yeah. There's stuff that you can't control and you're going to react or do certain things. But it's like, what can you do? Like, you have your reasons to be that. That person is like how you grew up or where you're used to. I mean, it goes either way. Not everybody's perfect. Wow. Oh. I'm gonna. I'm gonna ask you another question. <laughs> what, I I know this is a silly question, but like, what music do you listen to when you? Because <laughs> I'm I'm very big on house music. And, okay. And like, even when I run, or when I just play soccer, anything like I would just listen to house music. Like, it's what gets me going. What do you listen to? Like, how do you pull up to a game? Like, what do you? I like. Depends. I feel like sometimes, most of the time, I feel like it's rap. Then sometimes, like right before like game time, I listen to R and B. But if I was to pick an artist, I would say it's Kevin Gates. Kevin Gates. Kevin Gates. I've been a fan of him since I was like an ATL. Wow. So I know him before he was like famous. What's your favorite song? Uh. I feel like my favorite song out of them is In God I Trust. God I Trust. Yeah. I feel like most of his music kind of relate and just kind of brings him back to that. And, and at the same time, it motivates me to be the best me for the game. Like stuff like that kind of just reminds me of like humble beginnings and be grateful that I'm able to play another game. And it still pumps me up at the same time. So I feel like that's what I usually listen to before games, training sessions, just anything in general. It's kind of just... Kevin Gates. Pumps me up. Is there a, 
Another question. What What's the best player you played against? Best? Or were you considered the best? Like, I mean, I feel like a lot of people consider Raul Gonzalez. Raul Gonzalez? Yeah, when he was with the New York Cosmos. Okay, yeah. And Marco Senna. Marco Senna. Oh. They both played together with really? the Cosmos. So <laughs> Marco Senna was in the middle. And oh. I don't, he was in the middle with me. So yeah. it's, you pressure him and he's already thinking of something and you're like, How'd you see all that? Yeah. And then obviously Raul is the killer when he's on top of the box. So top of the box, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I've never seen something like that. I mean, I've been around and played against like great, like everybody knows, but I think those guys were just something that I'm just like, why am I here? <laughs> Can I just be subbed out? Like, especially when Marco said that he, I had a man mark him. Yeah. Just the fact that he's not the fittest, and neither am I, but just the way he reads the game is like, he's, uh, I saw that move, but I didn't see the second one you were that you played. It's like, I'm done. Like, I don't even want to play no more. But Marco Senna played Spain, Spain national team for yeah. years. Years, his whole career. And then yeah. Raul. I remember he was so good. He's like a, you want to say like a Xavi, yes, yeah, this type of stronger. style, but bigger and stronger, yeah. yeah. And sometimes he looked like he was out of shape, but... I mean, his, his touch mind was, was insane. Like, yeah, his mind and touch on, like, the game just started and I'm already dealing with this. Like, it was just a long game for me, especially with both of them on the field at the same time. It was like, my first year was just Marco Senna. Then my second year in Atlanta was both of them together. So it's just like, great. I'm just going to watch like a fan <laughs> instead of playing. Yeah. But those were the guys that were like, that is crazy. Mind like, blowing. It's crazy to think because, like, you're you as as a soccer player, I'm always like, oh, I could play against him. I could yeah. play against that guy, or that's not that tough. Or I could be around Xavi yeah. and Iniesta, and I'd probably man mark him. But <laughs> no, it's different. <laughs> it's different. Yeah, because yeah. obviously players in TV, they're as good as that players, but we feel like sometimes we can be in in their position. Like, yeah. But then you're there, and you're like, all right. You know what? I was just talking out of my ass. I'm definitely <laughs> not that great. And these guys are on another level, world class. And yeah. this is why they're here and there. And I'm here. World you know? class. So it's just like you kind of see everything like, man, I was just watching you TV. And like I was saying all this. And but, then now that I'm in front of you, I can't even back it up. Yeah. I gave him 1% because <laughs> I was like, what was I thinking? But yeah. you see the difference. Yeah. No, it's, that's a. That's a crazy point because I always see it and I'm always yeah. like, yeah, it could be that. And I'm like, Wait, come on. Yeah. That's the reality of it. But this. they just like, make it look so simple. Yeah. That's the thing. And we don't, we don't realize how tough it is because you try to do it in the game, it's completely opposite of what you thought in your head. And it's just, it's a whole mess. Tell me what so, made you start up this, so, this brand that I love and people need to know about. So, that's a very good question you have. Um, Vita Calcio started back in 2015 where, um, so I used to work for a company, I'm not gonna name them, but mm. because I, I don't know, I just don't want to. And um, pretty much I wanted something for myself. Like I'm tired of yeah. working for someone else and really creating for everyone else. And part of this podcast is really mm. just for that, like to give, opportunities to people like me and yourself to to create to have a voice to not mm -hmm. be behind the scenes and be like well <laughs> i can't say this or that mm -hmm. or whatnot and really what vita calcio is is a is an outlet for soccer players to do the same thing for any soccer player that wants to create that wants to be a part of something and i and i always tell people like do Vita Calcio, what do you want to do? Do you want to blog? Yeah. Do you want to do a website? Like we do all of that, like what blogs, websites, um, everything. And part of Vita Calcio is that for anyone that feels like they can't do it or yeah. they, they want to learn how to do it. And and a lot of people ask me, and when you ask me, like I tell you straight up, like this is what I do, this yeah. is how you do it, this is what you can do, is there profit in there? Is there, you know, like what what is it? And really, Vita Calcio is somewhere where you come to create as a soccer player. It's it's not my brand, ultimately. I feel like it's our brand, ultimately. Mm. 
And and that's really what it is. It's the football life. Fida Calcio is the mm-hmm. football life. And I, I trademark both of them because I don't want someone to come over and take them from me and be <laughs> yeah. like, oh, I thought about that. And, you know, I'm like, no, like, I thought about that. Like, yeah. it's crazy. Like, I, I don't come from a family that has trademarks that taught me how to do websites or taught me how to do podcasts or taught me how to do anything. <laughs> and for me to be creative and have a, a outlet is very important for not only me, but for the future. Like, this podcast will live on yeah. forever. Like, it'll be on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, it'll probably be YouTube's rights to have it or whatever, yeah. but it'll be on YouTube and you could always reference it and you'll be able to see this conversation forever. <laughs> and to me, that's fucking important as yeah. hell because it's it, the media is always controlled no matter what you do yeah. or where you're going. And and if anyone wants is listening out there and wants to be on this podcast that has a message to say and has a dear <laughs> desire to can't find a platform, then we're here and going back to your question why Vita Calcio well Vita Calcio is the same thing I feel like soccer was was my only outlet at some point like I could only play so much you yeah. know like I I would play and then I would show up somewhere and typically it would always be against kids that have higher resources than I did and and that was what I was better at. Yeah. And my team was always better than people who had more than me. So I was like, I'm going to show you that I can, I'm better than you at something. And it's not because you paid for it and I didn't. It's yeah. because I just genuinely am better than you. And that's it. And that's really what Vita Calcio is. It's like you have a passion for showing the struggle within all the fucking time. Yeah. Like I'm just like tired of showing it and showing it and showing it. But then getting to a career point where I'm like, I don't know where to show it anymore. Like, yeah. I, I get lost in translation with my job and I'm like, I don't, I have nowhere to go after. Like what outlet do I have? I'm going to create my own outlet. How many times do I, do you have that? Like you, you hear about rappers who do it, you know, like that's, that's insane. Like yeah. that's like when I do it now, I'm like, damn, this is a lot of pressure. Like this is a lot of, levels there's a lot of levels to this it's not just you know like uh a creative level anymore it's like a social economic level like how can we have this room to create a podcast how can we have silence to create a podcast? like even just silence in itself like i know we got interrupted earlier but to be in a place where you can obtain silence is almost like it's hard yeah it's impossible yeah (laughs) it sounds impossible right you're like Oh shit! Yeah, silence. Yeah, I didn't think about that. Silence. Uh, I thought it was just no, I told someone to shut yeah. up, and that's it. But no, you told someone to shut up in the wrong place, and it turns into a big deal, and yeah. blah blah blah, and you're like you're fighting over silence, and <laughs> and really, it's it's a breakthrough for for not only for me but for anyone who wants to be involved. And mm-hmm. Vita Calcio is that, and I think people get it like yourself, and people want to follow it, and. And it's gonna be here for a while. Like I, it's one of those things where I, I'm gonna hold on to until my kids take over, and then they can hopefully spread that message. And at some point, I want it to be more profitable, so I can yeah. really give back to people that can't maybe can't play soccer, or can't pay that coach's fee, or or can't don't have a sponsor, or or hey, I just want to juggle the ball and <laughs> and show the world that I'm really good. Yeah. Here's my video. Put it up. Uh, I'll do it. You know, like. But there's some kind of outlet. I, I know it's a lot easier now with you, the YouTubes and, you know, your Instagrams and people have their own outlets and that's great. But if if it's not available, oh, fuck it, I'm here. Like, yeah. Hit me up, like text me, call me, whatever. <laughs> email, email me, email me yeah. anything. And then we'll get connected. But the football life, Vita Calcio, it's really one of those grassroots things where I feel like I didn't, I didn't even think I could do. Like, I was just sitting, like, at the gym. And yeah. I was like, what the fuck am I going to do? Like, <laughs> I need to do something. I'm tired of working for someone. I'm tired of repping someone else's brand. Like, someone that something created. Yeah. I don't know how it got there. Um, so a lot of people get things handed to them where it's like, here's the investment. You do whatever. create whatever you want with it. And I'm like, no. Like, I'm. that's why sometimes you ask me and I'm like, what am I doing? And I'm yeah. like, I don't have 
fuck, I haven't made a shirt in <laughs> yeah. a while. It's not profitable. <laughs> like, I'm losing money. Like, shipping costs a lot. Um, but that's something that progressively, as even this podcast grows, like, I will keep giving back. And I hope, does that answer, like, the mm-hmm. question? Like, I mean, that's the. I feel like that's the reason why we ended up being closer than where we are. Yeah. Because well, obviously we saw each other in tournaments, like you said, or Sharif, stuff like that. But I think what brought us closer was the brand and not not saying like, hey, sponsor me and give me all the shirts. Like I was literally buying your shirts because right. I fell in love with who you were doing. It's yeah. like I'm a person that wants to support somebody's dream. Yeah. You know, and it's like, this is a great message. I play soccer. Like yeah. I can relate to it. So it's yeah. like, why not buy this? And I can still wear it. It's not like. I'm mean, getting paid for it, but it's something that I can wear proudly. And, <laughs> and that's what happened. That's crazy, dude. Cause, um, yeah, my, like my first sales, like I put up the website and then, um, I would tell staff, I'll be like, do like, has who's bought a shirt? <laughs> and she's like, that's great. I'm like, but that's not who, like, I want to, like, I, I never want someone that I know is passionate about the mm-hmm. sport to buy it. And I'm like, dude, but the markup's insane. Like, yeah. why would he buy it? Like, I just want to give it to you. Yeah. You know, like, that's just how I think. Like, I want to give it to you because I want you to actually wear it. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> but you're like, but then I thought about it. I was like, dude, like, he's really supporting me. Like, this yeah. is crazy. Like, he really believes in it. And let's move forward. Like, how do we, where do we go from here? Like, there's obviously something that I'm, that's contagious about yeah. this brand. And how do I keep it growing? Yeah, because I bought, well, like, four already five yeah <laughs> and i don't have none of them because people that were around me were like hey would you get that let me get that yeah and since i was like well you can look it up over here if you want to buy it like it's good quality that you see me wearing things like yeah some of them were like oh, no i was like, all right here let me give it to you like yeah. now i don't have none of the shirts so every time i see you post something I'm like yo that's dope like but it's like I don't want to just ask for it for free because that's yeah. not the whole point. Like, I want to just support somebody and just kind of just build a relationship where it's not just about money. Yeah. You know, it's more personal. It's like you you do you do this for me and I do this for you. But at the end of the day, you have a business, and that business I feel like needs to be spread out where a lot of people's eyes are on them, like, what is this? And it's like, I'm not going to tell people buy this, but I can wear it. And you ask me, hey, yeah, I know so-and-so that can do this for you, but you got to pay for it. It's, it's, it's me kind of supporting you, but at the same time, hoping that the brand expands because that's what you love. Yeah. So I don't want nothing out of it. I haven't, obviously, I haven't asked you for anything. <laughs> But it's like, I always tell you that's good or that's dope. I want that. And yeah. I'm buying. You always hook me up with like, oh, I don't have to pay for shipping or taxes. But it's like, I'm not asking for that. Just let me buy the shirt and just sell it to me. <laughs> yeah. Because I want it. And that that's just part of my giving mentality. You know, like I, I grew up with a family that's very giving. Yeah. And we never thought about like exploiting or I, I know it sounds terrible, but like literally like, oh, like I'm going to give you this thing. Like, you got to give me that back is what I'm saying. Like, that's yeah. what I mean by explaining. Like, I'm never like that. I, I'm always giving and and I know where my heart is. And yeah. really, that's what I want to do. And I want to continue this. Like, like I told you, it's like my goal is for everything is going up to get big yeah. so I can continue to do Vita Calcio. And that's really all it is. It's it's a it's a. It's a continuous cycle of giving, yeah. and that's w- where I'm going to keep going no matter what. You know, I say is you keep making new stuff <laughs> because I'm always wanting everything that you drop, so don't stop. I'll keep going, bro. Because you know me. I already got well, I got hats. I got like six shirts already, and yeah. that's like, like I told you, I already have Capacito Football, and that's the only one that I have. Yeah. And obviously the shirt that you made for me, but it's like, we have that one. You can yeah. you actually. You should probably grab that one. Grab it. Yeah. I, I honestly, I take it. That one's for you. No, I mean it's crazy because I have this one, and somebody wanted it off of me. But the only reason why I kept it is because I gave it to my mom. Oh, you did. Yeah. So she wears this one, 
whenever she can, she brings to the games or. That's a, that's one with you and yeah. you're wearing the cafecito y football Cafe, shirt. Yeah. So she then, has literally she has this one because I kept it because when you sent it to me I kept it. Okay. And I was like, I don't want to give it away. Yeah. But then my mom was like, I want it. So obviously, I'm her son, so I'm like, take it. So yeah. I remember she she wears this all the time, and it's a good one. It's not even that, but it's just this is what I'm making. <laughs> I know, and then this jersey too. I'm gonna rock this one for sure. Gonzalez, this one's sick. Thank you, bro. No problem. Got you.